Okay, welcome to a special edition of our Rad Path channel. Today we're going to be talking about contrast. My name is Matt Hartman from Pittsburgh, PA. I'm part of AMSER. And again, these lectures can be found on the ACR Building Blocks site. I will be giving an overview of this lecture, and I encourage you to go back, um, stop, pause this video. Um, but I want to give you a big overview. Again, our flashcards, uh, Anki fla deck flashcards can be found on um, with directions how to access these on our about section of our YouTube channel. So we're going to start with the question of what is contrast? So contrast is a material used to enhance internal structures, to outline walls, to find anatomy, and help us help us find the, the pathology that's going on within the body. This was from our title slide. These are three of the most commonly used contrast agents. And we have gadolinium on A, used for MRIs, water-soluble contrast, which can be administered orally or intravenously, and then barium, which is usually administered orally or rectally. So why do these agents work for CT or X-rays? Well, ma these materials all have a high atomic number. We're going to see the periodic table in the next slide. These high atomic number uh, elements will absorb the X-rays and will be radiopaque, radiopaque on the radiograph, as in here. Here's our periodic table and the three agents we use, barium, iodine, and gadolinium, all high atomic number elements. So we have the contrast and how are we going to use it? Well, CT will use iodine based intravenously, MRI gadolinium based ultrasound. This is something new that we've started. We use micro bubbles and remember air will be echogenic on ultrasound. Nuclear medicine, we're using radioactive material and fluoroscopy, either iodine or barium. So let's start with our typical GI fluoroscopy, barium versus water soluble. A lot of information here, but what I want you to remember is water soluble contrast is great for ruling out a leak first. The images might not be quite as sharp, but if there's a leak, this will be resorbed. Whereas barium, if there's a leak, it might cause a granulomatous reaction, but we're going to get better pictures. So typically what we do is roll out the leak, a big leak first with water soluble, and then move to barium, making sure we're not missing a small leak. So here's an example of a patient with suspected Borhovs, drinks the oral contrast water soluble, goes down, but then we get this outpouching. This is a leak right near the GE junction. And again, we used water soluble contrast first. Let's see an example using barium. Here's an example from a modified swallow. Barium's going down, nice and radiopaque, going down the esophagus and not the trachea. Here's another example from an esophagram. You have dilation up here. Narrowing, again, remembering the rad path patterns, narrowing there, upstream dilation. And what's the cause? Well, I'm worried about a mass here. It could be esophageal or it could be uh, extrinsic mass. We get the CT, truth machine, and this was a central lung cancer, small cell, causing local invasion around the esophagus. We, uh, it's obliterated on this image. Contrast throughout the body. Basically, wherever there's an orifice, we can inject contrast and get some good imaging. So arthrography through the joints, myelography, and geography, especially in the interventional radiology, looking at the blood vessels, fluoroscopy for GIGU. So when would contrast not be necessary? So of course for fluoroscopy, we have to give contrast, but for CT, there's certain indications where you don't need to give contrast. And in fact, giving contrast may um, hinder your diagnosis. So I think this is pretty good high yield information. If ever you're looking for a kidney stone, there's enough inherent contrast in those kidney stones. You do not need to give contrast. We will see an example of that coming up. Worried about a retroperitoneal bleed. 
worry about a head bleed, someone comes in with altered mental status, the first step is going to be do a non-contrast head CT, make sure there's no hemorrhage. And we'll talk about some other contraindications later. So the teaching point, in many instances, there's enough inherent contrast that you do not need to give uh, additional intravenous contrast to make the diagnosis. As in this example, this patient has a kidney stone, but for some reason, you know, having hematuria, we probably could have just stopped here on the non-contrast scan. We see the stone very well, but we're going to go to the arterial or cortical medullary phase. We still see the stone getting a little bit harder, and then we wait five minutes. The kidneys are excreting contrast. So this is five minutes later. Both kidneys are excreting, but where'd the stone go? We realize it's obscured because the density of the contrast is very similar to the density of the stone. So it looks like it's disappeared. But again, if you're just looking for a kidney stone, if that's your only question, do it without contrast and save the extra radiation. So when do you need intravenous contrast? Well, basically anytime you want a lesion or the process to be more conspicuous and to increase vascular and soft tissue detail. So anything vascular, we need to give contrast. So here is a liver lesion, hard to see on the non-con. Here's the arterial phase, it's starting to fill in peripherally. And portal venous phase, it's really filling in. This is, if you remember from our liver rad path talk, a hemangioma, a big bag of blood. You might hear the term CTA versus CT with contrast. So the CTA has special reformats done at uh, shorter intervals, get very good vascular detail here off the celiac axis, and usually done during the arterial phase, whereas just a regular CT with contrast will be done the, during the portal venous phase. And you get a pretty good look, but not as sharp as, as with the CTA. But again, this will be more radiation and usually uh, multiphasic. Um, doing a CTA of the chest for rule out PE. So here is our contrast going through the pulmonary artery, and then we got a big in ear filling defect. That is a pulmonary embolism. Again, we need contrast to distinguish this. So when do you need oral contrast on CT? Well, these days we're using it much less frequently. When I was a resident, we used it a lot more often, but um, trying to get patients through the ER more efficiently, we realized a lot of times it's not adding additional value. But if you're ever worried about a leak or a fistula, very important. And then anything that could look like bowel, especially our gyne-onc patients who might have um, a mental caking, this is a very helpful instance. I'm gonna show a case coming up. Here, we give the oral contrast that pacifies the bowel. This is not bowel, this is a mental caking. And we will learn uh, from one of our GYN rad path talks, we'll get a good differential for, G, uh, for a mental caking, but this is a case from um, ovarian cancer. Here's a case where we have the catheter in the rectum, We're worried about a rectal leak, and we get the outpouching of contrast. Again, this is gonna be water-soluble contrast that we're instilling. So what can go wrong with contrast? Well, our three main things are you could have extravasation, allergic reaction, or contrast-induced kidney injury. We'll talk about all three of these. So extravasation, the contrast does not go where you think it's going to go. And I think the best way is just to show this example where the CT tech administers the contrast. And instead of going through the vein, it goes through the soft tissues. Big deal or not a big deal? Well, it depends on the amount of contrast going in, the patient's risk factors. But what we want to avoid is this, big time ulceration. So we have a definite protocol at our institution. The patient will be assessed by the resident. We are going to document everything, remove the IV, uh, cold compress. Sometimes we use warm compress. I haven't seen definitive literature, which one's better, elevate the arm, do all the, the simple things, and we'll get a surgical consult if there is any neurovascular compromise. We have an EPIC order set for this at our institution. And always to document what's going on. And again, the example I showed is extreme. 
Um, most cases will be um, a small amount of extravasation. Allergic reactions, this is another big deal. Uh, think of contrast as a drug that's either be administered orally or intravenously, just like any other drug that we're giving our patients, you can have an allergic reaction. And it can range from mild to severe. This is a big deal. Um, if a patient is deemed allergic to contrast, uh, we have to know how severe that reaction was and make a decision, can we pre-medicate the patient or should we not give the contrast at all? Or can we do another study like ultrasound or MRI? So this is a common thing. Someone says they're allergic to shellfish. Well, hey, there's iodine in shellfish. Uh, maybe we shouldn't give them contrast. Um, they're actually not allergic to the iodine. We need iodine to live for our thyroid hormone. You're actually allergic to a preservative or a different antigen in the shellfish, just like you're allergic to a um, preservative or something else in the contrast. It's not the iodine itself. So keep that in mind. Again, contrast reactions can range from mild. I typically think of the uh, urticaria. Moderate or severe, basically anaphylactic shock. So not all allergic reactions are created equal, and our treatments and um, subsequent premedication will vary depending on the severity. But it's important to document it and get an accurate history of what happened and what didn't happen. So we will premedicate anyone with a history of mild or moderate reaction. And we have a definite protocol um, based on um, guidelines from the ACR, which I'll share at the end. But sometimes someone comes into the ER and it's an absolute emergency, rule out dissection, but there's a history of uh, allergy. Can you give them contrast? Well, there's a lot of, uh, Hopefully we'll have a quick conversation with the ER and they're gonna say benefit outweighs the risk. I'll be there to innovate if we need it and uh, we will give the contrast. We are ready to give epinephrine. Question, does Benadryl steroid ahead of time, like 10 minutes before help? It's probably not gonna hurt, but it hasn't been proven to help. But, um, and we have a definite protocol at our institution. You can pause on the slide and look at it. Um, and we use the ACR pretreatment guidelines involving steroids and a Benadryl. Again, there is an accelerated premedication um, that we'll use if not doing the full protocol, we'll delay care. This is our protocol for the accelerated regimen. So, despite our best efforts, or maybe it's a surprise, our patient had an allergic reaction. Remember the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, and be ready to administer drugs. Talk about those. So the treatment will depend on the severity. So again, the mild with the urticaria, usually get away with a Benadryl, make sure they have a ride home uh, or else they're going to be groggy and may not be safe to drive. And go up to more severe. We're getting ready to get the epinephrine out, especially if they're hypotensive. Never go wrong giving them oxygen, giving them fluids. Have a low threshold to call a code. We do a, a simulation with all our residents and med students where we run through all these reactions and get very uh, positive uh, responses from our um, students and residents. So anaphylaxis is what we're absolutely worried about. They will have low blood pressure, high heart rate. Again, oxygen, fluids, never go wrong with that. Get ready for um, the epi. All a code. This is in contrast to a vasovagal reaction where you'll have hypotension and low heart rate. So this is a secret for distinguishing anaphylaxis from vasovagal. What's the heart rate doing? In both instances, the patient will have a low blood pressure and is getting ready to pass out. But with anaphylaxis, it's a high heart rate 
with vasovagal, it's a low heart rate. And the treatment's different here. We'll give atropine. The next complication is something called contrast-induced nephropathy. I think of the contrast. If you ever see it, I encourage everyone to take a look at it. It's sort of viscous. And I think of it going through the body and being filtered by the kidneys during the pyelographic phase. And the kidney is a we know the kidney is a filter. If our filter is not the best, you know, we're diabetic, hypertension, what what have you, that contrast can get gummed up in the tubules, the collecting system, and effectively uh, diminish the, the overall filtration. And that's what we mean by contrast-induced nephropathy. And often it's acute, a sudden deterioration in renal function. I will say it's highly controversial, um, both diagnosing it and then the pretreatment. Uh, most of the original studies come from cardiac angiography. So the official position by the ACR is it's real, but very rare, which is fortunate. Um, I think we over we're a little bit overprotective for it, and we have, especially when I was a resident, but our, our guidelines have uh, since become a little bit more liberal. So there's definite definitions. We often use the uh, GFR instead of the creatinine, look for trends. Um, so anyone with the GFR over 45, most studies show that contrast is not an independent risk factor. Um, GFR 30 to 33, similar findings. The patients we really worry about if it is under 30. So in these patients, what do you do? Well, maybe you can do another test, ultrasound or MRI. We'll talk about MRI in a second. That has its inherent risks uh, using gadolinium. Um, but sometimes you have to bite the bullet and the clinician really needs to know the answer and you have to give contrast, but realize it's a risk benefit discussion. Uh, the question, yeah, if they're already in AKI, can you give them contrast? Um, again, ideally avoid it, but uh, it becomes a risk benefit discussion. Patients already on dialysis, so it's going to get filtered out on dialysis. So, um, not a contraindication for CT contrast, but we try to get the dialysis as soon as possible after. Now, MR contrast, again, we're going to use gadolinium, which is a metal, and it has a special magnetic property, which will uh, light up on the T1 post contrast images. So here's a nice example of a liver lesion. This is a T1 without contrast. We give contrast, you see the aorta's lighten up, but the liver lesions lighten up also has a central scar. You might remember this from our liver rad path talk. This was a FNH. But again, this is sort of the stealth lesion. Without the contrast, it's hard to see, but we see how well this shows up and we can make a confident diagnosis. This is a do not touch lesion. So, Gadolinium, some contraindications. So again, it's a drug and you can have some potential adverse reactions, just like the iodinated contrast for CT. Allergies can occur with gadolinium and are can be separate from the iodine, iodine uh, allergy reactions. They can be severe. Um, we do not give iodinated contrast to pregnant patients as it can cross the placenta. Something called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, NSF. This was something that was being discovered when I was a resident. It used to be that a gadolinium could do no wrong. Patient who couldn't get IV contrast for CT, no problem, give them gadolinium. The issue became, the more they were doing this, a small subset of, of patients were developing this scleroderma-like condition. And some very smart epidemiologists figured out that these patients were all dialysis slash chronic renal failure patients. They were using certain types of gadolinium-based agents uh, that 
were collecting in the sub-Q tissues and causing this scleroderma-like condition. So then the pendulum swung and we got very strict about who we gave contrast to and who we didn't, looking very closely at the renal function, not giving it to dialysis patients, not giving it to renal patients, and um, especially, and then with more epidemiology, especially anyone with a GFR less than uh, 15. So can you give contra uh, gadolinium contrast to patients with chronic kidney disease? So this is being worked out and different contrast agents, the class two, this is what we use our institution, most commonly use, uh, have uh, lower risk. And if your renal function is fine, no problem. Again, if the GFR is lower, it becomes a risk benefit. If they're on dialysis, similar thing. So, and again, here's the example of the class two agent, Gadavist, and they all have in common the gadolinium, but it depends on what the gadolinium is bound to um, for de um, determining its class. So dialysis patients, um, you know, our policy is patients who are on dialysis can get contrast, but they should get dialysis as soon as possible after injection. Again, if the uh, benefit outweighs the risk and we can't do any other study. So this was a whirlwind tour of contrast. I encourage you to check out the ACR resources for contrast, review this lecture. Again, the whole complete PowerPoint is on the building blocks, but I hope I've given you some pearls and information to be more confident about what contrast is, when to use it, and that if there is a bad reaction, what to do.